Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar from CWNP, Industrial IoT Concepts and Terminology. We're going to be covering some of the basics of the concepts and terminology in the industrial IoT world. And what we're going to do is get a foundational understanding for what has been going on in industrial automation over the last several decades. Because as we implement industrial IoT specifically, we have to think about how it's going to integrate, coexist, possibly sometimes replace these existing automation technologies that are there. So we can't simply say, well, I'm going to go in and put a system into a manufacturing, a factory, an oil and gas environment, a power supply environment, or anything like that, and just assume there's nothing already there. Unless it's a brand new company, they're going to have some type of automation systems already in place. So we need to understand what is there to understand how what we bring to the table can bring benefit. Now, as usual, my name is Tom Carpenter. I'm the CTO at CWNP, and you can follow CWNP on Twitter at CWNP and me at Carpenter Tom if you desire to. All of our webinars are archived on YouTube at CWNP TV. That's all one word, CWNP TV. So if you've not subscribed, you'll want to go ahead and do that. Let's take a look at what we're going to cover today. First of all, why learn traditional industrial technologies? Why even know what has been used there? in order to increase your knowledge, or is it for some other benefit? Well, it's in order to allow for effective innovation. So we'll talk about that. Then we'll get into industrial automation in some detail about what's gone on there historically, sensors and actuators, the roles they play, the control systems, including SCADA that are used. And then we'll talk briefly about some questions we need to ask when integrating traditional systems and modern wireless IIoT, or for that matter, wired IIoT. So we'll go into all of that as we go through the presentation today. So our first topic of discussion today is why learn traditional industrial technologies in the first place? Why does it matter? Well, it really comes down to technology innovation. And according to Innovation, Management Policy and Practice by D'Souza and others in 2009, there are six innovation stages. And I want to focus on a couple of them and the important role they play for us. It begins with idea generation and mobilization, advocacy, and then screening, choosing the best ideas. And then finally, experimentation, and they call it commercialization. I'm kind of rephrasing that to implementation. So experimentation is the ability to test the innovation in order to see how it's going to impact the environment and in order to determine if it's going to bring us benefits. And then the commercialization, of course, in their model, thinking about innovating and creating a new product, but in our model, we're thinking about innovating and implementing a new technology within an environment. And so we'll take that as implementation, actually rolling out the solution. Well, the key area where we come in then is experimentation and implementation. Sure, we might be involved in idea generation and mobilization. We might need to advocate for the innovation. We might even screen out different possibilities and pick the best solution. But as a technical individual implementing the actual IoT solution, we're going to get most heavily involved when it comes time to really begin the project and actually be involved in experimenting on a small scale and then implementing on a full scale. So here's the thing. It's challenging to innovate the unknown. So how do you innovate something if you don't understand the thing that you're innovating? And that's why it's important to know what is already being used in industrial automation solutions so that we can best understand how the newer IoT solutions that are coming along can also provide a benefit. And there is a real stark difference between traditional industrial automation and the newer IoT automation that is being evaluated in industrial environments and other types of manufacturing and processing implementations. Integration is often the first step of actual innovation actions. In other words, we don't go in and just replace, we innovate. Radical innovation is rarely the thing that we use in industrial systems because it's already there, right? There's a process that's there that's working and we don't go in with a forklift and just rip out all of the industrial automation they have and replace it with modern IoT solutions. More often than not, there's integration over time. 
so that we can get the benefits or advantages of IoT technologies. These are automation technologies that may have internet access, for example, and we get the benefits that they bring. So we add them where they can provide a benefit, but it doesn't mean that we wipe out all of the stuff that's already working. We may integrate IoT for monitoring of existing automation systems for some type of management and reporting. We may implement IoT in new automation systems that are going forward. And we may still implement new traditional industrial automation alongside of it as we go forward. So it's important to understand that incremental innovation is typically what we see used in these industrial environments because they need to continue operations. So a forklift replacement doesn't usually give the results that are needed. So successful innovation is really driven by proof of benefit. That is to say, in the technology area, if we're going to encourage and successfully achieve motivating people to implement a new technology, we have to prove it beneficial. And in the uh, book called Diffusion of Innovations by E.M. Rogers in 2003, they actually defined five key things that successful diffusion of innovations include. So diffusion as you know, is spreading about, right? So if the innovation is going to spread, if the innovation is going to be successful at getting into an environment, then we're going to have to look at these five factors. One is relative advantage. How much better is it than what we already have? Why would I use an IoT solution if the existing PLCs or RTUs or what have you, and we'll talk about what all those are if you're not familiar, if they're already working and getting the job done, and it's not any better to go with IoT, it's a tough sell, right? So we've got to ask, what's the relative advantage of it? What is the compatibility? So how does it work with existing needs? Is it not so much compatible with the existing systems, but is it compatible with the need? So can it achieve the end result? So we're now putting two things together. Can it achieve what we need to achieve? And can it do it better than what we're already doing? And then there comes the factor of complexity. How difficult is it to implement and utilize? If this thing is extremely complex, does it mean we need new professionals on staff to manage it in addition to the ones we already have? Can the current staff be trained to management? So in the world of industrial environments, we have what are called OT professionals, operations technology, instead of IT professionals, right? So they deal with the PLCs, the RTUs, the DCS, the SCADA systems, all of these existing automation systems, they deal with that. They know how to work with it. Are those OT people going to be trained on IoT or is someone else going to be responsible for it? And the complexity can drive that in some cases. And then they use the term trialability. And what that means is, can I implement this IoT solution on a small scale? to prove the theoretical benefit that I've already established. So maybe I've statistically proven that it can be beneficial, but can I do a small scale implementation and actually let management executives, even OT professionals that are using the other systems, see the benefit that it brings? And then there's this factor of observability. Are the benefits obvious? I'm sure you've been involved in technology innovation projects in the past. I know I have where you implement this sometimes multi-hundred thousand dollar project or even multi-million dollar project only to have it implemented and in place and people really take uh, the same amount of time to get the same job done that they did before. So there's no time benefit. Quality hasn't really improved. Nothing has changed that's obvious after implementing this, other than we're doing the same thing that company X is doing. And so we're doing the right thing. So we've got to be able to see obvious benefits in this small scale trial ability, the trial that we do, in order to really have that motivation to go forward. So these are key things. And I know this is kind of the soft side of technology, and we don't like to think about these things as much. We like to get in there and play with the knobs and switches. But these are important things to consider, particularly as IoT is making inroads into industrial, oil and gas supply chain management, and all of these other areas. Okay, so that gives you a bit of a reason why we need to understand the technologies. But in addition to that, we also need to ask, what is industrial automation? 
Now, I'm going to tell you right off, it's a huge topic, probably the two single best books that I can recommend. And I haven't actually read the third edition of William Bolton's book. I have the second edition of it. The third edition has just come out, and it's simply titled Instrumentation and Control Systems. Just a fabulous book. I've looked at the table of contents on Amazon and ordered my copy, um, and it hasn't changed significantly. So uh, that book is a wonderful book to have on your shelf. If you work with industrial IoT, you should have this book. Simple as that. The other book that I found very practical and very useful, it's an older book now, but it still holds a lot of value. It's by Frank Lim from 2013, and it's called Industrial Automation Hands-On. And kind of that hands-on part gives you a hint. It's very much so where the rubber meets the road, helping you to understand the practical implementation of these solutions. So if you just pick up two books on this topic, then these would be the two I would recommend. For the certifications we offer at CWNP, we don't require that you have an in-depth knowledge of some of these existing systems. We require only that you understand the basic concepts of what they are, pretty much what we're covering in this webinar, really. And uh, it's up to you to go deeper because we're testing your knowledge on the actual wireless IoT solutions that you might be implementing in these environments. And we want to make sure that you understand those. But I do encourage you to go deeper into these areas. So let's talk about this concept then of industrial automation. It's two words, right? So industrial, what is that? Well, factories or assembly plants that produce products. Uh, when we use the term industry, we say in industry or within industry, things like that. We're talking about economic activity concerned with the processing of raw materials or parts and the manufacture of goods and products in factories. That's generally what we're talking about. Now, we do often use the term a little more general. We say there are many different industries, and we might even include the service industry, right? So we talk about someone that's offering services within the IT space, and it almost becomes industrial in nature. But in this context, we're talking about that which relates to industry according to this definition. So we're really talking about those environments where we take parts that we receive in through supply chain, we then assemble those parts, we may manufacture some of our own and combine them with them, and we create an end product. Uh, or we create a component that another organization is going to get from us through supply chain and then use to build an end product that goes to a consumer. Uh, for example, uh, I live in Marysville, Ohio, which is famous for only one thing, and that's that we have a Honda plant here. And so Honda builds automobiles, right? But what a lot of people may not know if they've not paid attention to the automobile manufacturing industry is that not everything that goes into a Honda is created at the Honda plant. Instead, there are many other companies around the county and in adjoining counties, and these companies make parts. They make parts for other people too, but their primary customer is Honda. They exist to provide parts for Honda, and then they sell them to whoever else they can as well. And so all those parts get shipped over to the Honda plant, and the Honda plant takes them and begins manufacturing and putting together the thing that becomes a Honda Accord that comes off of the assembly line. And so that's what we mean by industrial in this context. So automation, well, the simple definition is using fully or partially automatic equipment to perform an action. Automatic equipment is self-operating, right? It does it on its own. For example, the old way to make ice was we would take the ice trays out of the freezer, and hopefully most of you are old enough to remember this, but we would take the ice trays out of the freezer, we would bend them a little bit, or maybe there was a lever that we pulled up to loosen the ice cubes, and then we'd pour those ice cubes out into a container and use them to cool our beverage. Well, now we have automatic ice makers in the refrigerator, right? And there's simply a tray, the ice maker makes the ice, there's usually some type of a bar that is down in the tray, and as it fills up with ice, it rises up, and that sensor tells the ice maker, stop making ice, it's already full. When the bar goes down to a certain level, it tells it to start making ice again, right? That's automation. We have it all throughout our house, from our washers and dryers, to our refrigerators, to our stoves and microwaves. Automation has become pervasive in the consumer space, and of course, it's also used in industrial space. Now, one of my favorite explanations of automation in industrial and other environments actually comes from a really old document. You can find this online. 
It's free to download now, and if you search for human and computer control of undersea teleoperators, I know that seems odd and you might think it's unrelated, but there's a lot of really good information in this document from 1978. It was written by Thomas Sheridan and William Verplank, and in there they talk about automation and some of the things that take place with automation, and they give four ways that automation can be used to extend, to relieve, to back up, and to replace humans. So. On the left side of this diagram, this is their own hand-drawn diagram from that document. And on the left side, you see the humans just taking care of all the load. They do it all. The task is 100% human performed. Okay, you can think of this like a craftsperson who works in their own uh, craft environment, and they have hand tools that they use to make wood crafts, right? So in that environment, the human's doing it all. Yeah, they have tools, but they're doing it all. Nothing is automated. Now, another level would be to go to the level of extending. And what this means is that the human uses computer technology to extend what they can do, to go further than what they could do themselves and maybe do it better, maybe do more of it. You know, the simple example of that is if I have to do multiplication with seven digit numbers and I'm doing that all on paper manually. I can do that, but it will take me all day to do maybe several dozen calculations. However, if I use a computer and I just punch in those numbers, I can get the several dozen calculations done in a few minutes. And so that would be an example of extending the human capability. The other element here that is in the sharing category, they divide automation into sharing and trading. The other element is relieving. And what this is, is, okay, the human does work, but the computer assists them in taking on some of that work. It lessens the workload of the human. So they're very similar, but both of these have in common the concept of sharing. The computer and the human are sharing the workload. Now, when we get to the trading category, which is where now the computer's doing it instead of the human, it could be that it's just a backup. So the human normally does it. If the human doesn't do it for some reason, the computer system detects that and it does it automatically. We don't see as much of that these days, but it is a possible way of implementing automation. The more common we see now is replace. And so this is where now the human is no longer involved. Notice our little cute human character is missing and the computer simply does all the work. Complete automation, without human intervention, at least once it's programmed appropriately and it begins the process. So I love this representation. It's a great way to think about how we can use automation. And just think for a moment about IoT. If we try to take IoT and place it into this, we see on the left the human without IoT. And then extending, what does IoT do for me? Well, if you think about something like Alexa, right? or any other voice activated system. And I can say to it, Alexa, how long is the Golden Gate Bridge? And Alexa comes back to me two seconds later and says to me, well, the Golden Gate Bridge is X meters long. Now, could I figure that out on my own? Well, yeah, in the old days, I, I could have driven down to the public library, found a book that would document it and look up the length of the Golden Gate Bridge. Nowadays, I could fire up my mobile phone or my laptop or desktop, and I can go to the internet and search for how long is the Golden Gate Bridge. So I could find that still even using a computer in that second example, but IoT makes it even more capable. It extends my capabilities even more. I don't have to pause what I'm doing. If I'm in the kitchen talking to friends and we're making dinner and somebody says, well, where in the world does time come from? I can say, oh, I don't know. Hey, Alexa, where does time come from? The herb. And it can let me know all about it, right? So it extends my capabilities. And then, of course, relieving the human with IoT. Think about a, th something like a garage door, right? The garage door, we can open and close it manually or we can have an automated system that does it. My garage door, for example, detects that it's been open for a while. If there's no movement in the beam, the infrared beam between the sensors, then after a while, it just automatically closes that door for me. It relieves me of that duty. You could also think of that as kind of a backup. 
So relieving me of the duty would simply be an IoT system that closes and opens the door for me. A backup would be, I forgot to close the door, I drove off, and now it's going to close the door for me. And then, of course, IoT can even replace some of the things we've done in the past. Think about the, the old system where we maybe set our thermostat on one thing during the summer and another thing during the winter, at least for those of us that live in climates that have a true summer and winter. Well, now IoT can simply replace that for me, being pre-configured to automatically adjust it based on checking the weather forecast for the future, things like that. So rather than being as simple as, well, every year in April, I change the thermostat settings. Every year in September, I change them again. It's doing it dynamically for me all throughout the year. So that, for example, the folks in Texas who recently went through a shocking cold spree uh, they probably didn't have any system in place to think about winter versus summer as much. But guess what? The IoT system could look at actual weather forecasts and make decisions for them. Replacing the human, I simply tell it how I want it to react according to changes in the weather. Now, I no longer have to monitor the weather. The IoT system does it for me. So that's an example in the consumer space to kind of help you wrap your mind around how even this old 1978 concept still applies today in the world of IoT. Okay, so what do we need to talk about next? Well, let's talk about the pieces that make automation possible within industrial and other environments. And it's about sensors and actuators. But I want to talk about them a little more generically first and just talk about measurement instruments. So the old term, going back many, many decades, is measurement instrument rather than the concept of sensor. And a measurement instrument in the traditional term over here labeled zero on the left is simply that we have some kind of a thing that is a sensor and then there's a gauge that shows what the sensor is reading. And these traditional measurement instruments were typically very analog and you simply had to walk up to them and look at them. And that's how you read it. Then the next step was to say, well, let's take that sensor and let's put its data through an amplifier and a conditioner and give us a display. So the amplifier and conditioner introduced a digital component, giving us greater granularity, greater accuracy in the actual measurement. But still, we generally went up to the display to look at it, whatever the display was. The next phase, labeled two, and these aren't necessarily sequential phases, there's some overlap, but it gives you an idea of the process that we've gone through. We have the sensor that goes to the amplifier and conditioner and still has the display, but someone had the great idea, well, why don't we keep a history of what the display has read in the past? So at any time, an engineer can walk up and view the display recorder and actually see the trends that have been happening, still requiring going to different locations to look at the information in most cases. And then the final stage of automation is, okay, let's take all of that stuff and let's pass that data to a control center of some sort. And at that control center, we can then view all of the information from these measurement instruments that we today call sensors. Now, of course, this is focusing on just measuring or monitoring, but actuators can also be used in the same concept, meaning that now that we have the ability to process what is coming in from the sensors, we can also instantiate an actuator to tell it to change something, change flow, change temperature, um, turn something on, turn something off, etc. right? And so these concepts of sensors and actuators play a big role in IoT and in traditional industrial automation. So the sensor reads the information, monitors the information, the actuator can be told to take action in relation to what is being read. This is true with IoT, and it is also true with traditional industrial automation. Here are some examples of sensors. I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on it, but it just gives you an idea. These all happen to be wireless sensors in this case. And we see a strain gauge sensor. So this is something, you see that flat portion. It might be mounted on a wall or on a column, and it detects the slightest bend or bow in that wall or column, which can tell you the strain that it's under. These are used in order to monitor the health of a building, a bridge, things of this sort. Strain gauge sensors are very commonly used in that way. So you might have these in all of the columns of a bridge, 
sending their information back to some monitoring station that can tell you if there's any excess strain based on environmental conditions changing, the age of the bridge, so forth. We have an ambient light sensor, and so this can just detect light, and based on that, then you might have an actuator that is fired. So the light sensor tells you it has detected light, and then you can send a signal to an actuator to take some action based on that detected light. And it might be a different action depending on the time of day. Here's a simple uh, all-in-one unit from Edimax, which is an air quality sensor. So, you know, looking at things like uh, carbon monoxide and things of that sort, and then reporting back to the cloud in this case, and you can have automatic alerts fired from it. We have a range sensor, so it can not only detect that there's something at a location, but how far away is it? Is it getting closer? Is it getting farther away? And decisions can be made based on that. And in the lower right, we have a sensor from Lord Technologies, which is actually a sensor connector node. So you can take any traditional sensor that can be wired to the appropriate plug type that you see here, and then this device will wirelessly send back that sensor data to the network so that it can be processed and possible actions can be taken. And then we simply have a table of different temperature sensor types, thermocouples, RTDs, thermistors, infrared, the common ranges and so forth that they have. The goal is not to go in depth into all of these sensors here, but just give you an idea of some of the very common types of sensors that are readily available. These happen to be what we would categorize as IoT sensors. They use wireless communication protocols, some of them proprietary, some of them standards-based, in order to transmit information back to the network that can be used for processing. So that gives you an idea of sensors and actuators, which are really the starting point of the data that's used in industrial automation. Now, the next thing that we need to explore then is what do we do with this data that we're getting from our sensors and how do we communicate with actuators? And it comes down to control systems. A system is any unit that receives input and produces output, right? The unit has some type of internal processing or actions they may be hidden or undefined for the user. We don't really care. We just want the output that we want. So think of a, a water filtration system that you might use in your home. You know that there's unfiltered water going in and filtered water coming out. You're not necessarily concerned about the exact type of filters as long as it meets some purification specification that you desire. And so the key then is that the system itself just does its job. It takes the input, gives you the output. And it's up to you to pick the right system that gives you the right output. Control then is constraining the system based on variables. So for example, I may have a water filtration system that can run the water through one cycle or two cycles or three cycles, and it gives me a different level of output. So I might have a kind of control that simply says run it through two cycles, or I might measure the output and change the number of cycles depending on the quality of water that I'm getting on the output. And so one of those would be an open loop system and the other would be closed loop. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. There are three categories of control that are commonly referred to. Uh, controlling variables, sequences, or event occurrence. So when we're controlling variables, we're controlling things like temperature, pressure, flow level, size of machined objects, weight, all of these kinds of things. So we're simply controlling those variables, like the temperature of a liquid or the temperature in some type of a heating system, the pressure within a pipe or the pressure within a container, etc. Controlling sequences is about moving something to a location, possibly doing something there, moving it to another location, doing something there, maybe discarding things that are detected to be faulty. This would be controlling sequences, so actions that take place in a flow, in a sequence commonly done in manufacturing environments. And then controlling event occurrence is simply based on some variable, we either have an action that we're going to take or not take. So these are the three common categories. Not everything fits nicely into just one of these categories. Sometimes it's all three, sometimes it's two of them, sometimes it's just one of them. And you may run into some things that don't fit as nicely into these categories, but these are the three common categories of control. When it comes to control, as I've already alluded to, we have open loop and closed loop control. So open loop control is just take an action based on some variable. So, so take this action based on the laws of the system. We know, for example, that if the temperature is currently 60 degrees in a room and we want it to be 65 degrees, 
then we're going to need to run the heater for X amount of time based on the way that system has worked. So we can simply say, turn on the heater for this amount of time. So we have the input of an amount of time. We have a timer that simply says, open the flow. So maybe this is a liquid process in this case. And then we keep it open for that amount of time. And then we close it. And we know the container is filled based on the flow amount that goes through per second. And therefore, if we have a timer that opens the flow for a certain number of seconds, we'll get a particular size container filled, right? So the laws of the system dictate that I can use, in this case, an open loop control because I know what it's going to do. But what if I have many different containers that might be coming down the line? In that case, I want a closed loop control. We're going to take action for X, monitor the input, and adjust X. So we're going to take an action possibly for some defined amount of time, but we may adjust that time on the fly based on what's happening. We may cut it off early. We may run it longer. We may not even have a specified amount of time. We may simply say, open the flow until I tell you to close it. And so the controller has communications with a sensor and an actuator. The sensor is evaluating how full the container is. And then based on it reaching a level that we consider full, 12 ounces, 20 ounces, 200 ounces, whatever it is, we send a signal back to the controller how full it is, and then the controller, when it gets to the condition we call full, simply sends the actuator command to close the flow. And now the container is filled. So one of them, fixed size container, fixed amount of flow, the law of the system tells me I can do it for a certain amount of time. The other one, variable size containers, unfixed amount of uh, fluid then, and I need to simply open the flow until it's full and then close the flow. And many different types of sensors could be used to accomplish this. Now, this is a general concept. Whether you're using open loop or closed loop is going to, of course, depend on the system that you're using. One of the most common types of controllers that we use is called a programmable logic controller, or a PLC. Another is an RTU that's similar to it. Um, we will talk about remote terminal units or remote telemetry units or whatever you want that acronym to stand for briefly a little later on and compare them with PLCs. A PLC then is a computer-based controller. It was born in 1970. Um, the, the legend tells us that an individual was coming off of a hangover and he got the idea. So maybe that tells us about some ways in which ideas are born. But at any rate, it's a computer-based controller. It has simplified programming logic. So you don't have to be a master programmer to program them, but you do have to learn some kind of programming. It may be reprogrammed by engineers for different tasks, so you can load a different program to do different things. And then it may participate in a PLC network with supervisory PLCs and local PLCs. So supervisory PLCs are monitoring and controlling local PLCs, which are monitoring and controlling sensors and actuators. Many network types exist. I'm not going to get into the details of all of them. There are well over a dozen different common types of networks used for PLCs, RTUs, DCSs, and so forth. And computer networks can be used to connect the PLC to the enterprise network. So if you want to get data out of the PLC, there may be a module available for the PLC that allows it to send that data back to some centralized system. It might be a SCADA system, or it might be some other custom developed system. The PLC itself is typically programmed with a language called ladder logic, but they also do sometimes use function blocks borrowed from the DCS world and other worlds. We'll not get into the details of programming languages and so on today. So this gives you an idea of what a PLC really is made of on the inside. Of course, there's a power supply so that it can function. There's a computer in there. And then it has input modules and output modules. So on the input modules, it's receiving information from sensors. And then the output modules, it can be communicating with actuators. So the PLC can both monitor and control if so configured. And the input modules and output modules, they'll vary depending on what kind of systems you're talking to and what kind of information you need to gather. Another system we have is the distributed control system or DCS. And this is also sometimes called a decentralized control system. It was born a little later in 1975. And the goal was to allow for multi-system control compared to PLCs at the time. So back in the 1970s, PLCs were really kind of one-off units. This PLC controls this system. This one controls this other system. And there's really no communication between the PLCs or centralized management of them at first. So in 1975, the concept of a DCS was born saying we need this integrated control center, this single point of control 
what we in IT nowadays call a single pane of glass, right? So one place to go in order to manage and control all of this. DCS is often considered better for safety than PLCs because of single vendor implementation. And then other people say PLCs are better for safety because it's faster in response time. So it's a debate that does go on. DCS is used in large scale implementations. And that's the historical view of it. But things are changing a little bit. So the lines are blurred. Many PLC implementations can do most or all that a DCS can do. And many DCS implementations implement more rapid response times. So yeah, some of it's a little challenging today. The general guidelines, and this comes from Automation World, a great resource for information about industrial automation. Um, they recommend that PLCs are generally faster and more suitable for time-sensitive applications. And generally, that does still hold up. Remember, they're usually localized, right? They're not communicating back with a center system for control, so they're closer to the edge. DCSs are generally more scalable, although, again, that's getting blurred these days with what we can do with PLCs, especially with SCADA systems. DCSs are generally more cost-effective for redundancy because it's often built in, whereas with PLCs, we're implementing a second PLC, and, and then we're implementing a supervisory PLC to manage them, and it, it gets a little bit more complicated sometimes. And then PLCs are simpler for small-scale deployments. So if you just have one or two systems you need to control, PLCs are usually much easier to implement for that kind of system. And they're best for consistent processes, where DCSs are best for variable processes. But again, that's the historical view. This has changed a lot with some of the programmability that's available today for both of these systems. And then we have this thing you might have heard of called a SCADA system, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. They're very commonly used in oil and gas, electrical power supply, and industrial manufacturing. It collects and examines processing data in real time, and it logs that data for analysis and review. So these are the two big things that it does for us. And it does this based on its communications with hardware and software. So it communicates with those PLCs we just talked about, or possibly remote terminal units. Now, this is another area where there used to be huge differences between PLCs and RTUs. And it's not as big of a difference nowadays. Uh, but the biggest area of difference is mostly in the build. So today, RTUs offer improved environmental tolerances. So if you're in a hostile environment, meaning weather conditions or temperature conditions and same, things like that, RTUs may be manufactured to better handle that type of environment. Um, they often provide modules to control specific units as well. So they're custom modules that control specific types of sensors, actuators, or systems, and it makes it easier to implement that. And they may offer more languages. It's not uncommon for RTUs to be programmed through C Sharp, Basic. Um, I've even seen a couple that supported Python. And so there are ways to program them other than the more traditional ladder logic and function blocks and so on. So all this data from the hardware is aggregated into the SCADA software system. And then the SCADA software system can communicate with the PLCs and RTUs, possibly in some cases reprogramming them, but certainly monitoring them and taking all that data and centralizing it so that you have monitoring and controlling of very large sites or even multiple sites. One of the big selling points of SCADA initially was remote control. Rather than having to be on site, I could be at a different location and actually manage those systems and environments. So this gives you a visual idea of what SCADA components might look like. We have here our PLCs, and they're connected to sensors, actuators, other things. There's a SCADA master that aggregates all of this data together. And then there's an operator workstation that communicates with the SCADA master so that you can see dashboards, you can possibly do some configuration programming, things like that, in order for the system to work. And remember, the SCADA master may be accessed from a remote location. Now, this has been a jet tour of industrial automation concepts. And I already told you it's a big category. So remember those books that I referred to earlier in the webinar, they can be a really good reference. If you do want to go deeper into some of these areas, maybe I've kind of whetted your appetite for what these things are and how they work. But now what we need to do is move on to think about the next phase. So the next phase is how do we integrate traditional systems and modern wireless industrial IoT? I'm not going to spend time on technical protocols and things like that here. We can get into those in later webinars, and we will be later on in the year. 
So we'll talk about, for example, wireless heart and how it works based on the more historic heart protocol and how that can integrate with existing PLC systems and DCS systems. And all of that can happen on a technical basis. What I want to do is take just a couple of moments here as we're reaching the end of this webinar that's really aimed at giving you an understanding of traditional industrial automation so that you can begin to think about how to integrate industrial IoT into it and answer some key questions that have to be considered. And here are those key questions. What devices will be integrated and what devices will be replaced? So the first thing to ask when we're looking at what the new industrial IoT systems offer is what do they offer to me? What do they offer to our environment? And is there a real benefit to actually utilizing those in our environment? So it goes back to some of those things we talked about earlier. Where do we see an application of IoT as opposed to traditional industrial automation that can provide a true benefit to make it worth the cost? And what devices will be replaced? So there might be new devices we're bringing into the environment that do things we're not doing now. And then there might be devices we're bringing into the environment that are replacing existing solutions because they do it better. And then what is the plan for integration and replacement? Do you actually have a roadmap, a plan that you're going to go through in order to achieve this? And here's probably the biggest question of all. You will find many people talking about this at IoT automation conferences or industrial automation conferences, I should say. If you go to these events where the big vendors for SCADA and PLCs and DCS and RTUs are meeting and gathering, it's a common question that comes up when IIoT is discussed. And that's who's in charge? Who will control the industrial IoT as opposed to the SCADA, DCS, PLCs, RTUs, and et cetera? And this is a big, big concern and issue that we have to address. So traditionally, there has been a separation in industrial environments between IT and OT, information technology and operations technology. One of the big things that industrial IoT gives to us is all of this data and information from our plants, from our oil and gas pipelines and processing, or whatever it is, all of that information can be gathered together for business analysis. And that means getting it out of the industrial environment and into the corporate or enterprise environment. And you have to ask, who's in charge of that connection point? Who's in charge of harvesting that data? Who's in charge of actually managing the security of that data and so forth? And so there are fears and concerns that always come along with this. I mean, the general concept of automation itself introduces fears and concerns, right? So if you think about automation, let's bring this home to those of us that work in IT. Imagine that there's a robot that can mount an access point and that that robot can not only mount the access point, but then wirelessly can automate the configuration of that access point through a controller and do it all without a human being present. And so it reads a design document that is maybe in something like an IB wave or Ekahow format or what have you. It reads the design document, looks at blueprints, automatically determines where it needs to go and mounts the AP and then configures that AP automatically, having connected it to the cabling. Okay, so someone had to get the cabling there. Well, maybe in the first stage. <laughs> the point is, does that raise a concern for those that mount and configure APs? Sure it does. So imagine the concern of the operations technology professionals and the right and proper concern of, wait a minute, you're bringing in all this industrial IoT stuff I don't know about. I know PLCs. I know DCS. I know SCADA. I'm a master of all of this. I know ladder logic and can do it in my sleep. So none of that's going to be used if the system is entirely replaced with industrial IoT. So do I have a job? That concern often causes resistance, right? And so it's a common historical thing that anytime there's innovation, there's resistance over concern of job losses and things like that. What we've also seen historically is innovation has always resulted in more opportunities and more jobs, but it did often require retraining. So this is an issue that organizations are going to have to tackle. 
Are we retraining OT people to do the role? Are they going to continue in the role with SCADA systems and other such systems? And new people will work with the industrial IoT solutions? This is a question that has to be answered, and their fears need to be understood and addressed by management. That's not necessarily the job of the person doing the industrial IoT implementation, but it's important to understand that there can be some resistance and there can be some issues there that have to be addressed. And it needs to be clear who's controlling what, where are the edges of control, and um, uh, what is the responsibility of the different groups and individuals. And I personally think that a synergistic relationship between IT and OT is the way to go. Because of the things that we've talked about here, those people working in OT, particularly those that have worked for more than a decade in OT, they know that environment so well, and I need them badly when I'm implementing industrial IoT solutions. I might understand LoRa and LoRaWAN. I might understand Sigfox or Zigbee or Z-Wave or Wireless Heart or ISA 100.11a or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, right? So I might understand all those things, and I know them, and I'm a master of them. But I may not be a master of PLCs and RTUs and what data comes out of them and how do I condition that data so that my IoT devices can read and understand it and send it back to my IoT solution, which may be in the cloud, and, and, and then process that for business analysis. So I, as an IoT integration professional, need to be able to partner with someone that understands that and work with them. And a synergistic relationship between IT and OT is going to be, in my opinion, essential as we move forward over the next decade and see more and more IoT solutions coming into the industrial space. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank you for attending the webinar today.